I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting CapitalAllocators.com. Over the last decade or two, no asset class has generated as much interest and investment dollar returns as private equity. This eight-part miniseries, Private Equity Masters, is a set of conversations with some of the longtime leaders in the space. We'll hear their stories, those of their firms, and their perspectives on this all-important area of the capital markets. My guest on the second episode of Private Equity Masters is John Connaughton, co-managing partner at Bain Capital, a leading global private investment firm that oversees approximately $130 billion in assets. Founded in 1984 as the pioneer of a consulting-based approach to private equity investing, Bain Capital today invests across private equity, credit, public equity, venture capital, and real estate. Our conversation covers the early years of private equity at Bain Capital, its growth in products and assets, investment process, competitive environment, culture, and succession planning. We close with JC's insights for allocators and his outlook on private equity. Please enjoy my conversation with John Connaughton in the second episode of Private Equity Masters. JC, thanks so much for joining me. Pleasure to be here. I guess we should start with a pretty simple question from way back when, which was, what was Bain Capital in 1989 when you joined? I'm a a student of the cycles in our business. In 1989, it was a particularly challenging cycle, the barbarians at the gate. But at that time, I was in consulting. I had some mentors, and I was telling them that I love this Bain Capital place that I I got to know because I was a consultant for one of their companies, and I want to go join and see what this is all about. They all said, this is the worst possible move that you could ever make. (laughs) It's the end of the buyout business. Drexel's going under. Mike Milken is going in jail. There's this KKR deal that has come under enormous negative reputational challenges. And nevertheless, I still jumped in. And ironically, some of my mentors joined me later at Bain Capital a couple of years after that. So it wasn't the most interesting time in terms of the go-go years, but it ended up being obviously a terrific ride from that point forward. So what did it look like back then in the early years? Well, we had 11 people when I joined. The firm founded itself in, in 1985, and it was a spin out from Bain & Company, the consulting firm. And Bain & Company was pretty unique in the consulting business because they were sought after to be implementation experts, not just strategy experts. And so not only did they come up with the ideas, but they had one client in one industry, and then they worked with management teams to then implement the ideas. And that was a novel concept back then. So when Bain Capital was formed and when I joined later on, the whole idea behind the firm is different from the financial investors that were largely populating the industry is we wanted to actually think strategically and then implement plans to change the trajectory of businesses we bought. And so instead of earning a fee to do that, like we did in consulting, we would want to buy those profits, if you will, at a discount and create that inflection. And so that was sort of the the nature of our entrance into this industry, and we were quite a bit different. It required understanding industries more deeply. It required understanding strategy. It required understanding how to implement. We actually went into the companies myself. I was a executive at a few of our companies, even early on in my career for temporary periods. And so it was fairly hands-on and distinctly different than the financial investors that largely came from Wall Street that were in the industry at that time. And what was the scope of it back then in terms of even just asset size and the industry as a whole? It's a funny fact because I think we were the 10th largest fund when I joined. And I think our first fund was around $37 million. And that was the 10th largest fund. Now, mind you, today, between all of our global, at least private equity funds, we're about $23, 24000000000 billion, including our own capital. So, And today, we're about probably the 10th largest fund. So <laughs> it was different in scale. But the concept was the same. We were trying to grow top line, double digit, grow double profits over five years. The percentage of equity back then was 
very small. So if you could double profits in five years, you could make 10 times your money. In fact, one of the big metrics that we all often saw was 10 times our money in five years, which is a 55.8% return, which was what we targeted. We didn't always earn that, but, but it was part of our targeted objective, given operating performance like that combined with leverage could generate substantial returns. Well, the facility of the math at getting 55.8 compared to the rule of 72 today says a lot. In <laughs> <laughs> but the principles of if you can find a company that you can double profits in, particularly if it's not perceived as one by others that, that is capable of that, that's gold. That's the gold of our industry is having a unique insight and then putting muscle behind making it happen. So back then, when you looked at where you wanted to deploy that, I know Bank Capital started as a venture firm. What was the thought process as you looked out and what you wanted to become? Well, early on, I think it was being really strong and and understanding what we could do with the company. So we built out our portfolio group. We knew that was going to be required. We built out the verticals that we wanted to participate in, tech, healthcare, consumer, industrial. And so you know, in the beginning, it was pretty simple. We wanted just to be really good at the three things we could be distinctive around, which is strategy, understanding industry expertise, and implementation. And so we weren't really thinking about scale. We weren't thinking about other business units. We were just thinking about how many companies could we buy that could achieve our return expectations and fulfill a potential that others didn't see. And, and a lot of those deals were, they were proprietary. I mean, that that was a different time. You found deals and you made transactions happen. It wasn't as competitive, but the nature of what we were trying to do was far more, I would say, inefficient. And it's what you found on the field. And so we've had to get a lot better at that. And we've had to get a lot bigger in scope. And we've had to actually understand what capabilities we need to add. But in the beginning, it was fairly, fairly much focused, almost like a consulting project. You know, you do a diagnostic on an industry, you do a diagnostic on if the company is performing relative to its own potential in that industry, and then you put leverage on it. And at a price that that time you transacted. And then, you know, at that point, we also held our assets longer. One of the unique elements of our firm is that we've always been our largest investor. So we didn't really think about raising money and we weren't great on Wall Street. We weren't great at raising debt. We weren't actually that even that good at being deal makers, but we were really good at this strategy and operation intervention. And and so that was what it was like. And it worked really well. And it works well today. It's just a lot more competitive. Just so we can lick our chops, what were the kind of multiples you remember paying back then? <laughs> One of my f first deals, you know, I do a lot of healthcare investing. And there was a business that a company called Baxter Healthcare, big healthcare company, owned a lot of different divisions. And we did a lot of corporate carve outs, but this business was one that was an orphan inside Baxter. They never invested in it. They had lost one of their key suppliers. The business was going negative. There were pieces were learning some money, some were losing some money, and they just wanted out. But what was really important to them is they wanted a partner who would still distribute the products through Baxter. And so we negotiated a carve out three times EBITDA at that time, which obviously today in the diagnostic world, things trade at 15 to 20 times. So that's a, in of itself a big opportunity for us. But we also had to do some heavy lifting about turning the business around. Were there a marquee deal or something that as a firm you look back on today and tell the story over and over again of a particular situation from the early years? The way I was introduced to Bain Capital was we were looking at the oil field equipment industry, which in the late 80s, as you know, when oil went to its lowest level at that point, there was a lot of carnage, a lot of challenges. And Baker Hughes had bought an oil field equipment business and that happened. You know, all of that carnage happened to this business. It was in the offshore drilling and subsea wellhead business. Very exciting business. I spent a lot of time in Aberdeen, Scotland and Singapore and, and of course, Houston. But we ended up convincing the sellers that we would be the best operators of the business. And so the sellers in this case had $200 million of preferred on a business that was losing $50 million. And they asked us to put up some money at least to show that we had some risk capital. So we put up $7 million for a business that was losing 50. Now, the good news is that we did operate it well. The oil business stabilized. We invested in some really interesting new products and we ended up making 40 to $50 million by the time we we exited to Asaya Brown Bavari. But it's a great deal because it had shown at the time that we could do what we wanted to do, which is understand a industry and dislocation, 
we could do what we wanted to do operationally, we invested in new products. But actually, the thing I love about that story most is that the confidence that the seller put in us because they rolled over a big stake in the investment and the fact that we were able to purchase it based on that preferred stock being something that we would recover for them, um, it allowed us to have a really great partner. And I think that partnership story in terms of how we talk about carve outs with counterparties like Toshiba today or or others like the big corporations that we see out there divesting businesses today, that's one of many important chapters that show how we can partner with those kinds of counterparties. So at some point in that early evolution, any one of these boutique specialist investment managers runs to this point in time where you say, should we just keep doing exactly what we're doing or should we evolve into something else? How did that start to take hold at the firm? I didn't get there at the founding. So there were five partners there in the early days, but there was about four or five of us that came along in the late 80s maybe a year or two after me, a couple you know, around my time. And, and of course, we were very sure of ourselves and we, we thought, well, gee, how are we going to have your job? How are we going to be partners in this thing together? And he had a pretty flat partnership and he really felt like growing the size of the pie was the way to win long term. So they didn't have a choice, Bain Capital, but to grow <laughs> because they had to <laughs> satisfy the ambition of a lot of probably overly confident young bucks who felt like, look, unless we grow this firm, we're not going to be able to keep our talented people. And I tell that story a lot because every time I have somebody come in my office and tell me, gee, I don't know if the firm can get bigger or where's my opportunity. I, I say, I've had that conversation with over a thousand people at Bain Capital since I've been there for 32 years. And as long as we keep growing and as we keep providing opportunity for people, it's going to all work out. It's interesting because it, at that time, one of my peers went on to run our and start our public equity business. One of my peers started our credit business. One of my peers reinstituted our venture business as a dedicated business. One of my peers went on to start our Europe business. And then one of the other ones went off to become a CEO of serially of three of our companies. So it's a little bit of a HR strategy first, which resulted in really a growth strategy. All along the way, how did you balance that opportunity set you're providing for the people, the up-and-comers on your team with clients who often look at those kinds of evolutions and say, well, you should just stick to your knitting. We like what you're already doing. We do have the luxury of having investors that have been with us since the mid-80s and have rolled over their capital and created very large endowments as a result. And they do challenge us all the time about what is the right growth strategy. And I would say even there is an idea that growing too fast is a challenge. But it really is the case that retaining people, if you look at it through that prism and retaining talent, that is, in fact, in their interest to do. And if on top of that, you start off with a premise, which I actually believe is true, that you can achieve high performance at scale. There's this natural tendency to believe or, or feel like that scale is correlated with lower returns. And it is, by the way, but it doesn't mean it's causal which is to say, if you can find the selective opportunities at scale where you can generate high performance, which we think we've done over the course of our history, our large deal performance is as good and sometimes even better than our smaller to midsize investments. And we can actually build more capabilities. We can actually have a bigger team. We can be more global in our scope. And you know, all of that makes our business model that much more effective. What were some of those challenges to growth along the way? It's never a smooth path. Well, I think that one of the things that's unique, we don't have a CEO model. I'm a managing partner at Bain Capital, which means I serve my highly ambitious and, and highly needy partnerships, desires for what I should do. And the truth is, when we started to build scale and we were in five businesses, we actually got into credit and public equity and venture before anybody else in the late 90s, we acted and operated as partners and were a consensus-oriented, team-oriented, collegial environment, but we didn't have the single point accountability that you really need as you scale. And so working through committees and working through part-time jobs to manage business units or geographies or even the firm, it didn't work as well, particularly through the, the GFC. And so I think that what we've done a lot over the course of the last 15 years is really build the benefit of the partnership and that how do we all work together to increase the size of the pie and, and all of that ethos is still alive and well, but also have single point accountability 
in our core business units and geographies, and even verticals, which I think has helped a lot and made us a more effective organization. So if you go back to that point in time where it wasn't working and you look back today, you're a bunch of really smart, ambitious people. And yet, whatever it was, the decision-making process wasn't as effective as it had been, maybe what it's become. What were the specific things you learned in getting to whatever it is, good decisions, good investment decisions, good business decisions that you struggled with in that period of fast growth? Well, I think that there is this concept of adding additional voices and insights and perspectives to the room. It seems like it can only help. So having a larger and larger group of people providing input when they're really smart people, it seems intuitively obvious. You would think that we'll just get to a better answer. But I've also observed that it can dilute accountability. It can dilute a really good dialogue even. And so we decided that there's a pretty good balance between not having everybody participating in the decision, but having a subset that are focused, that could see the continuity, that felt accountable, that could have a really good dialogue. And that's just one example. But I think our process changed a lot 15 years ago to get into a better dialogue such that you're not just undermining the benefit of those voices, but leveraging a subset in a very effective way. Are there other lessons that you advise others, say, on the outside of the organization that are kind of going through that same phase that you picked up that you think permeate a lot of organizations? Yeah, I think that the other thing about our business is that it's all about how effective our people are and how empowered they feel. We take a lot of risk. We're not always right. If we're not making some mistakes, we're not taking enough risk. And so once you get to a larger scale and you have multiple levels, in order to be the apprentice business we need to be, we need to allow people to actually be empowered, to take some risk, to actually feel like they are accountable and actually go out and execute. And so we try to become flatter over time. We're, we're a unique animal in that. Even myself, being for 32 years there, I was doing deals up until like three or four years ago. Some of our most senior partners, our chairs, are still doing transactions. So we, we like to feel like we're practitioners first, but we've built a scale organization that needs to be managed. And so having that flatness, having that empowerment, that's really critical because we're not a factory. We're not actually using the leverage of analysts and associates and principals to actually delegate decisions, delegate intimacy with the diligence. We need to be practitioners who understand and feel the primary work and make really good investment decisions. And that requires us to be flat. That's really interesting as a lot of people evolve both in the success of the organization and the growth. You do take on different roles, right? You start as the analyst, you become an important person on the deal team. And as you said, sometimes the partners no longer are as involved in deals. How do you strike that tension between the flat organization and mid-level people who feel like they're in their prime and they want to be running deals? First of all, we do operate as a team. And the unit of work, if you will, that's out there is a deal team and a company value addition team. And there's obviously a lot of overlap because we have continuity between the two. But as it relates to what somebody can do in an early part of their career, they can be leading deals, but they're part of a team. So it has the benefit of their accountability, but we structure it such that we have two partners on every deal. That's oftentimes a senior and a more junior partner. Same thing with the portfolio company setting. We have a portfolio dedicated specialist working with a lead partner. And so I do think that you do get those opportunities, you know, leading verticals, leading deals five or six years out of business school, and ultimately you just get more opportunity to then lead, lead the vertical and lead the overall efforts among a broader team. So I think you get that experience. What I'd say that is unique about our culture is that everybody talks about networking and relationships, and you need to have all of that. But we take a lot of our investment strategy edge from proprietary insights, facts, information that we see differently than others. And fundamentally, that comes from the bottoms up. So when we're talking in an investment committee about what do we think about this company or this investment thesis, we're asking the most junior people who are closest to the work to articulate their view. We literally go around the room and have every person on the team talk about what do they see as the bull and the bear. It's not just the partner who's trying to advocate for the deal. It actually literally is the piece of work that built into that element of the investment thesis that people need to take ownership of. 
most of our people grew organically in our business. Because we all started there, I think we value that voice a lot more than I think in another firm that has a lot of laterals, or they maybe hire an outside consulting firm to drive some of those insights. They don't do it internally in a captive way. If you take that and look at, let's call it across the strategy level, right? The unit is a business. And you started at venture and private equity. And as you mentioned, there's credit, there's public investing, there's real estate, real assets. How have you thought about what's worked and what hasn't as you evolved from just private equity to all these other strategies? It's a really great question because, as you mentioned before, you know that's the first question your LPs ask you: Why are you doing that? And particularly in these days where there's this race for this holy grail of of assets under management, and and actually, honestly, we, we've never pursued assets under management. We're still a little bit of like a hyperscale family office. We have all these great businesses, but partly it's because we want to invest in them behind people we actually feel are capable. But the two things that I look at are, one, do we have the right person to lead that effort that we have enormous comfort with? We're not a franchise model. Our culture is fairly well-baked at this point, and I think it's a good one. And so finding people that identify and want to work within our culture and ultimately can be capable of running that kind of business, that's critical. So we have nine businesses right now. Eight of those nine businesses were started by somebody who started out in that private equity business you described. So they had to almost learn, if you will, that other business. So the good news is that what they had going for them was credibility and they had relationships, but they had to understand the public equity business or the credit business or the tech ops business or the life sciences business. But then we married those folks with laterals and greater technical expertise in those types of industries so that we had the Bain Capital DNA and credibility and relationships combined with the technical and credible experience, especially when you go across the globe as well. So that's the first one is you have the right people. The second one is the prism that we look at through each of these new expansions is, is it going to help our core business? So understanding where tech dislocation is happening has been enormously valuable for our private equity business related to companies that are being disrupted or have opportunities in tech. We've done security software across both early stage, late stage, and buyouts. So if it is something that can actually reinforce our depth of our verticals, life sciences, tech, industrial, consumer, then it's a great idea. That's one of the reasons why we have a life sciences fund. They have incredible technical expertise. They work hand in hand with our private equity business. Same thing with venture and tech. And so that element of, is it reinforcing the core versus just a another asset under management. I, I think that's a second prison that is incredibly important for our expansion. What are the situations over time where you thought you'd have that additional insight, that additional information, the synergy across these products, where for whatever reason, the strategy might have been successful, but the informational synergy just wasn't quite what you thought it would be? That's an interesting question. I think it's worked pretty well so far. Maybe answering the question a little bit differently. We're not in infrastructure. We're not in energy investing. There's a lot that we're not in. And frankly, we weren't even in real estate, even though we tried for all 30 of my <laughs> years up until <laughs> a couple of years ago when we actually took over Harvard's real estate business. So, so actually, there are a number of businesses we've chosen not to be in for this very reason, which you won't see us get into for that reason. And so Again, I do think that there's obviously constraints on some of the private public context that doesn't allow you to actually share some of those synergies. But I think the industry expertise is still pretty rich with at least so far what we've expanded into. You mentioned the strong culture of the firm. I'm really curious, like, what is the prototypical Bain Capital person like? There is this intellectual curiosity that I think is core to what makes a Bain Capital investor different than the typical stereotype of our industry. I mean, I think that 80% of our people come from consulting and operating backgrounds. It's like the inverse of the rest of the industry, where 80% come from finance and investment backgrounds. And the core of what makes somebody go into that industry to begin with consulting is intellectual curiosity, problem solving, 
And I think that's quite a bit different. Now, by the way, I have a healthy skepticism. I only spent 15 months in consulting, so I wouldn't want that as my profession, although I have very good friends at Bain and McKinsey and others places. But, but I think if you take that core intellectual curiosity and you put it into a team, if you walk the halls at Bain Capital, you're not hearing just about deals and leverage and finance and going out public. You're hearing a lot about like, wow, it's like, this is an unbelievable company and this is what we can do. And if we can develop these products, if we can streamline the manufacturing. And even if you look at our investment decks, 80% of it is about market, company strategy and implementation of our thesis. And it's not like a lot of financial models. Now we have all those too. We have to have those, but it, but it really is the ethos to have this you know, intellectual curiosity and focus on both strategy and operations. When you take that into the execution phase, and particularly in private equity, I'd love to chat about the sourcing environment, because it's one thing to be able to look at a beautiful business. It's another, as you mentioned, like competition is so much fiercer than it was a long time ago. How do you think about where sourcing comes from these days? I think sourcing is an interesting term. We all look at assets, and we see many of the same assets but we don't see them all the same way. And honestly, we don't always get to buy the beautiful businesses. They're oftentimes ones that don't want to be sold or they're already public. And one of the dirty little secrets of private equity is we're already adversely biased against beautiful companies. And it's, if you buy one, you probably overpaid. So fundamentally, when we think about sourcing advantage, it's not just finding the deals. We have the saying at Bain Capital, you know, great deals are made, not found. And if you don't feel like you made the deal, then you probably are overpaying for an asset. And what I mean by made is there's an element of it, which is sourcing, being one of the few that are looking at it, uh, hopefully one of two or ideally one of one, but that doesn't happen very often. You have done more work way in advance of finding that company relative to the industry knowledge, networking with CEOs and other executives who are in and around that industry or company having the depth of experience and understanding of what that opportunity might be capable of delivering, then you actually do the hard work. I mean, we have teams, some of our teams are as large as 40 people, global teams working, even across platform. When we did Toshiba, I mean, it's a huge team, global team. We did Virgin Airlines in Australia, huge team across credit and private equity. So you do the hard work of like everything that's knowable, you got to be able to have the tenacity to get the outcomes of that work done and have a judgment ultimately applied to it. But if you don't do the work, then you're really not adequately taking a calculated risk the way you should. So I think that's another piece of it. Another way that deals get made, not found, is you actually position yourself relative to the counterparty. So I mentioned the Vecca Gray story. You know, we have bought businesses from founders, from corporate counterparties, where we were not the highest bid, but there was another reason why they felt like selling it to us, certainty, ongoing relationship, rollover equity, pride in what they founded. There's a lot of reasons, but if you position yourself relative to the seller counterparty as being a partner, and there's a reason for that partnership and why it should work, that's another way that deals are made, not found. And then ultimately having this view that you're going <laughs> to create inflection. Anything that's linear and high quality, we never win those. Bank capital doesn't anyway. But if it's an inflection point where you have to believe that you're going to do something, change the future, not just see the future, that's where we win. So all of those things I call sourcing. And even our portfolio team, they're in the underwriting process trying to understand, can we achieve this plan? So it's gotten a lot more complicated, but all of those things I put in the bucket of sourcing. When it comes to winning a deal, as you mentioned, you're almost never just at the table with the seller. Where does the relative market power sit today between the sellers of the business and even in a situation where even there's just a few buyers in that dynamic of getting the deal done? The seller always gets the highest price available out there. There's this famous thing that partners would always bring into the investment committee. It's like, we're the buyer of choice. And by the way, I believe we are, but that plus a nickel more will get you the deal, right? So I do think it matters to be the seller's choice. But but I think that from this point, maybe to, I don't know, 15 years ago, you got to pay the highest price. So the only way that you can generate the kinds of returns that we've generated is, again, you got to have a different point of view 
on what others don't see, and you got to have a different point of view of when you see it, what you can deliver by making that happen. And so it's funny because the first derivative of this is that we sell a business all the time. And when we sell a business, there's oftentimes a sponsor that buys us from us. So they see something differently than we see. So it's the first derivative of the same thing. It's like it, there is an inefficiency ultimately that remains in our industry, not to get the highest price. They'll get that. But to have the prospect of returns be judged differently by one sponsor versus another, one strategic versus another. There is this sort of fascinating coopetition angle, right? There was a period of time, you know, maybe it was more pre-financial crisis, where there were a lot of club deals on these bigger and bigger fund sizes. And now, as you mentioned, a lot of these businesses do change hands from a private equity owner to another private equity owner. So you're buying something in some instances from another sponsor thinking you have a differential insight. You're selling it to someone who has a differential insight. And in some instances, you're teaming up with people along the way. How do you think about where you want to position as a competitor compared to a cooperator in the ecosystem? Well, yeah, there's a lot of history behind this, but if I could challenge the first premise, we're all competitors. And I don't think anybody chose to be in a club deal to be a cooperative competitor. I think they were just doing it through their own commercial self-interest. I mean, even HCA, which I worked on, which is a $33 billion deal, $5 billion equity account at that time, there's no way that a single sponsor could do that deal. One of the reasons why this has changed a lot since the global financial crisis is that people can do deals with larger fund complexes on their own, and, and they choose to do that for this very reason. The only time there is a partnership is there has to be a specific commercial reason. So we partnered with Advent, for instance, in the payment space, and we've done a serial number of deals. We've done five or six payments deals right now. But the beginning of that partnership started with they really knew the U.S. payments business. We had a strong Europe presence and a great relationship with a seller in that case. The equity count was of a certain size that it made sense given our own concentration risk. So we started a journey with, with Advent on that payments business, WorldPay, in the very beginning. What happened is that then a bunch of other payments business came up, and so it was logical for us to kind of roll into those partnerships such that we were not in any way conflicted. So anyway, I'd say there's a commercial reason. We have enormous respect for our competitors, but we want to win the deals that we like and ideally control them ourselves. So you mentioned earlier the importance of the cyclicality of this business, and I'd love you to both touch on that and how you're thinking about where we are today in the cycle. Yeah, well, it goes back to the start of my journey is that every cycle, uh, the prediction goes that being private equity, the golden age of private equity is over. And, and actually worse than that, that there's going to be some huge carnage that results from the aftermath of a crisis. And it was predicted in you know, 89, it was predicted in 2000, 2008. And again, I think going into to COVID, I think what people fail to acknowledge or recognize is that we've been on this secular journey over, let's call it 40 years, where the private equity model is just fundamentally, even at its core, even if basic level, forget about how we do it, which is much more sophisticated. It's just a better model for equity value creation than any other model. And it starts off with the idea of thinking long-term, public markets don't do that, active governance, we govern these companies very actively, and then obviously efficient use of cost of capital. And so that's sort of what started this industry. And then in each crisis, I think we've learned that we're better able to manage crisis than anybody because we are long-term. We have a lot of resources. We've realized we need more capabilities. So our teams are getting bigger. They're coming more specialized. They're understanding global markets better. They're, we have capital market specialists and talent specialists and finance specialists and and so out of each of these crises and out of each of these moments in time, our ability to invest in our business and actually be better able to both be involved in a more competitive landscape, which is what we're in each time, but also continue to build the secular growth in the industry. I think that's the story of our industry, every cycle that's happened. And yeah, some people get lost in those cycles. I can name a few, but I think those that invest in their platforms and learn from each prior cycle have grown and grown a lot over that 40-year period. Given the benefits and the success of private equity as an industry, I'm curious how you came to the decision and continue to have strategies in the public markets. Well, I think that there's different strategies in the public markets that people 
deploy. And the ones that I think are the most successful, particularly given that the hedge fund business has had a lot of challenges over the last decade, is if you sort of think about all the arbitrage that was being taken out of the market by by information and factor analysis and a lot of the quantitative public investors that are out there, that's not our style and certainly never was our style, but it was the style of a lot of people that were wringing out all those arbitrages and, and that created a business that no longer was a business over time. For us, concentrated, long bets still rely on what you know, what your perspective is on an industry, what your view is on that company's strategy. And yeah, while you don't implement it, like we do in private equity, it does at least hold a lot of the same pillars of long-term and industry knowledge and strategy and company assessment that our private business does. So I think the skill set does have a lot of resonance with how we go about investing even in our private business. And when you've gone across from equity to credit, there's always this question of, are there conflicts? And you've got a privately held company, you own the equity, you could or may not own the debt. There's an issue if you do own the debt. Maybe there's an issue if you don't own the debt. How have you thought about working out the various potential iterations of where conflicts could arise across your products over time? Since we started so early in the debt business, in the public equity business, we were worried about this issue that you're describing, Ted. I mean, I think so worried about it that we actually didn't call those companies or those businesses Bain Capital. We called it Sankity for our credit business, and we called it Brookside for our hedge fund business. Because we were worried about you walk into a a CEO who's a public company, if if they see Bain Capital, they're going to run for the hills. Oh my God, you're going to take my company private. And same thing with credit. Can't walk into another sponsor with a Bain Capital business card. (laughs) It wasn't until, I think it was uh, six or seven years ago, that we thought, wow, it's like, let's check that premise. It actually has been incredibly powerful to rebrand all of those businesses, Bain Capital. And we've gotten so much advantage that it really has allowed us, particularly internationally in Asia, to leverage a single go-to-market, at least from a sourcing standpoint, that we haven't really seen the conflicts. You know, we're not loan-to-own investors in credit. We're not actually trying to restructure businesses as aggressively as some other people that are in those businesses. We're either a secondary participant in credits or we're primary where we're not providing capital, even in the same size. You know, Our mezzanine business is mostly mid-market. And so we haven't actually seen that. And certainly relative to the people that want us to finance them, it's so typical these days to see KKR Financial and and GSO and Bank Capital Credit. It's a pretty well-worn path here without a lot of concern. As you've grown the team, the organization, the strategies, where are the bottlenecks today that inhibit further growth? Honestly, I talked about the GFC and some of the acknowledgements uh, that we had around organizational change that we needed to accomplish. We also had to do a lot of performance management around people who were basically at a point in time where they they themselves wanted to do something else. But I think that we also had a desire to grow, but we didn't really have the people, the right leaders to actually expand the business. I mean, a good example of this is our life sciences business, which has been incredibly successful we had one of our partners go off to be the chief strategy officer of Biogen. And it wasn't a great time for us to expand right after the GFC, but we got him back. We put him with another healthcare partner, and now we're on our third fund that we're launching this year. So it is about people, and it remains the most challenging constraint. We wanted to Japan middle market for, for the last four years, but we just needed to find the capacity. And since we grow organically, a lot of our people, it does mean that they have to come up through the organization oftentimes. How have you thought about ownership and succession as you know, now you've got a firm where you and your peers when you started are at least maybe a little bit closer to the end of the careers than the beginning? That has to be true, I think, chronologically. Our partnership is pretty different than, quote unquote, those peers that you're describing. I mean, there are some people who have a similar model, but we do have this saying that we're a stewardship in our partnership. And you know, obviously, we're not public. We're a private partnership. I think we generate actually differential returns in that group of people, partly because it's our own personal capital. But we don't have a model that is driven off of a single CEO. We do have a very deep team. And we've had a lot of succession, um, starting with MIT. We've had a head of Asia that moved on, and we had somebody come up and become head of Asia. Same thing, North America, and Europe, and 
in our public equity business. So we've had a lot of experience, but part of it is we have this philosophy that it is a stewardship. I mean, this is a very attractive business to be in. You build a career of professional development and you build a career of the opportunity to make money and wealth. But we also have a lot of people who understand that in order to make it work, they need to deliver it to that next generation. And that's different than selling it to the public market or monetizing it in a concentrated way. And it starts with that premise that we had a fairly flat partnership. And I think it's allowed us to retain our talent because if you're a company today that's given away half your equity, you can only give away your equity once. You can't actually give it away twice. And so right now, that's one of the reasons why our generations of partners that are leaders now stayed and, and are motivated by our model. In these last call it dozen to 15 years, starting probably with Blackstone, you have had some of your peers go public or have vehicles go public. So I'm sure the conversations come up. What are the pluses and minuses in your eyes of whether you would ever do that? Everybody asks, would you guys ever go public? And I and somewhat, I don't want to be glib about it, but I would say I, only if it's an advantage. Goldman Sachs was private for a very, very long time. And they realized it was a disadvantage because they had capital requirements, so they went public. Now, one of the reasons that I at least assess this trade-off, is it going to preclude our ability to expand? Is it going to preclude our ability to motivate, attract, and retain great people? And as we thought about the trade-offs of that, we found that we can attract the people we want to attract, retain and motivate them by remaining private. We can get into new businesses very easily. We do have a balance sheet. You know, Balance sheets aren't only the purview of people who are public. And so capital, if it's required, is certainly readily available. And by the way, we're not trying to be in every business. We're not trying to optimize around assets under management. We're trying to, I say, we're trying to optimize around profits under management, this high performance at scale, which means that most of our income is driven by performance, not by fees under management. And as a result of all that, it's just at this point, a better model for our firm. Now, by the way, it's a terrific, Blackstone's done an amazing job. KK, all these players, they've done an amazing job. I think it just speaks to the segmentation that's going on in our industry and the strength of our industry that these different models can thrive independent of how they're formed. You mentioned balance sheet capital. I'm curious in the evolution of the business, at what point in time did you start thinking about retaining assets on the corporate balance sheet as opposed to maybe in the early years paying it out as people are generating their own wealth? Well, I think that in some ways, as I mentioned, we're a bit of a family office, right? Because just the amount of investment activity, the amount of the amount of capital that each of us have personally in our own cooking is incredibly different than their industry. I and mean, we have 15% of every dollar is our own capital, and that's multiplied by a very large dollar amount. So in some ways, that balance sheet has always been there with just the personal capital supporting the business. But look, as we saw places where we wanted to incubate something new, if we needed risk retention for credit vehicles that emerged from a regulatory standpoint, if we wanted to bridge certain activities across a fund and seed different businesses, you know, I think our ability to have a balance sheet was emerging as an effective tool, particularly given our scale, because the cost of capital that we can derive a balance sheet with is very, very, very low. And so... It's just a tool, and among many tools of being large, is you can have a very low cost of capital and allow yourself to, to use your balance sheet for those kinds of strategic purposes. Now, I know alongside of all of these direct investment activities, your partner's capital created a fund, I don't know if it's called partner's capital, that are outside manager investments. And I'm curious, when you put the LP hat on, What are some of the lessons you've learned from engaging in those activities that are different from the Bain Capital direct strategies? I think that effort and those investments are largely on things we don't do, although it didn't start out that way. I mean, it was a bit like, you know, the partners had a lot of friends and we were doing direct stuff off our side of our desk and it wasn't the way to run a railroad in your own personal portfolio. And so I think we focused that effort a lot over the years to be one where we're really leveraging the white space that we're not engaged in. So emerging market public equity, seeding investments in new managers that engage in activities in macro investing. or And so what we've used that vehicle to accomplish is to fill in some of the, some of the white space that are not mandated by our current investment activity. 
which makes it more complementary and then fills out what a general asset allocation might look like, at least in alternative assets. And so from that standpoint, I think the lessons we've learned, Alpha is all about the manager, you know, it's not about the asset class. So not only have we learned that we want to invest behind some of these managers that are in that fund, we've actually seeded some of them. So we actually want a piece of this GP. So it's a, it's taken it one step further to say, look, we want to make sure we qualify this for our own capital. We also want to make sure we can even invest behind making that business scale. And so that's how we've looked at it. I know from your experience in working with a lot of LPs and being on some committees, you've been on the other side as well. What are some of the lessons that you've learned from sitting on investment committees that are kind of broadly applicable for chief investment officers in those seats? One of the philosophies that I bring to our own investment activity is we are trying to do something that's pretty hard. We've earned over a thousand basis points higher than the private equity mean during our history. And part of the reason that we're able to do that is one, it's pretty simple. We aspire to do that. A lot of people don't. A lot of people basically are targeting maybe premium returns, but they're just largely looking at averages and saying, hey, look, if I could put more money to work at a return that's acceptable to investors, then I'll just put more money to work. Whereas our optimization function is, hey, I want to earn an exceptional return. And the reason that's important in our business is portfolio construction. If we could have 15 shots on goal to make three to, in some cases, 10 times our money, we won't do it every time. But if we do it a third of the time, then we're going to earn that thousand basis points premium. And so, so I think when you sort of look at the strategy of, a, of an investment firm is what are they aspiring to do? Are they trying to achieve that return? How are they going to do it, obviously? And do you feel like the portfolio construction lines up relative to that? Because I find too often that people are saying, okay, we're going to generate 20% return, but it's not about 20%. It's about the asymmetry of that return and how much upside can you get. And so I think it's just a different orientation towards portfolio construction that I think needs to be understood and studied better. What do you think holds for you and Bain Capital over the next 5, 10, or 32 years? I think we're at an incredibly important inflection point. And I thought we've been here before, but I think we're at one again. And frankly, I think it's a bit of an existential crisis for our for our industry. And I really mean this. We have an enormously negative stereotype that's associated with our with our industry. And I think it's incredibly inaccurate, but nevertheless, perception is reality if that's the conventional narrative. Now, what's, what's interesting about our industry, particularly in the nature of what's happening in the corporate world more broadly, is that people are focused on multiple stakeholders. People are focused on long-term impacts that are not visibly seen in short-term exposure. And so this notion of what is it to be a good steward in the corporate world and how that affects how people view the corporate world, I think that's times 10 in private equity in terms of exposure and adversity if we don't do it right. The positive side of this, of course, is that there are incredibly great virtues if we do it right. I mean, I think we are long-term in our orientation. We do control these companies, so we can make ESG efforts happen. We can control boards and make diversity happen. We can create a constructive stakeholder engagement more broadly and build and grow businesses the way I think we do. And if we get that right in this next chapter, not only will we be not negatively stereotyped, but we'll actually be the constructive force I think we are in an environment that's looking for that kind of solution. And so I think it's a very interesting inflection point. I see enormous activity in our own firm, but also even at other firms in our industry. And I think that's a real bull case for private equity in this next chapter. Uh, Jesse, I want to ask you one more question before we get to some fun closing questions. And that is, what do the LPs of yours not see that are kind of the hidden gems of Bain Capital? I tell the story and it's so nuanced, which is, you know, everybody asks me like, what's your compensation philosophy and how do you actually pay people based on their own performance? Aren't you worried that somehow if you're not providing microeconomics and their own internal behavior, the whole thing's going to fall apart? And I said, no, I mean, you know, investment careers, they get judged over time and you have to look at the mosaic of the entire set of activities. And then they ask, okay, well, what about these new business units though? I mean, how are you going to get the life sciences business to work with your private equity business? Don't you need to give them economics and have, and I'd say, honestly, no. 
And so the secret sauce that they don't get is that the reason why they want to work with each other, the reason why we have the longest tenured Asia head, Japanese head, and India head, and by the way, they every other sponsor, they turn over like every minute. The reason we've had people there for 15 years in those seats is because they know that when they pick up the phone and talk to somebody they need to talk to about retail or healthcare or help me out with this capital market transaction. They know somebody on the other side is a Bain Capital person that wants to work with them, independent of economics, because they know that they're going to call back the head of China one day and say, Jonathan, hey, hey, tell me about what's going on with the auto sector. I really need to know based on your on the ground view of these things. And so that collaboration, it's not mercenary. It's not transactional. It's not incentive based. It's actually because there's synergy in that collaboration. And that happens every day. That's why we can have a team across the globe, across three verticals, across two of our business units, accomplish a Toshiba or a Virgin Airlines. It works because it's organic. All right, JC, I'm going to ask you a couple of fun closing questions. What's your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? I used to be in a band in high school. It was a really bad band. I think it was, by the way, it was a punk rock band. I think it was called Shattered Voyage. And so I've always had this unfulfilled creative side. I'm on the board of Berkeley Music, and I get a lot of concerts and musical performances. I still play with my daughter every once in a while. So I have this unfulfilled creative thing that I, I try to get out of my system as often as I can. I even still organize haunted houses. I was one of those kids that you know got all the neighborhood kids together. And, and so I, I love that side of my life that's quite a bit different. What's your most important daily habit? I wasn't always this way. I, I was one of those persons that like between college and 40, I thought I could eat anything. I could, I could do anything and it would all be fine. And then I started gaining 10 pounds every five years. So my, my wife got me straight. She's a fanatic workout person. So even though I'm not a morning person, even though I failed to work out for that decade, since 40, uh, every day I'm out there at 6.30 and and I don't like to do the same thing. And actually, it's fun because I get to do it with my wife when I'm not traveling. We work out together, which people think that's really kind of strange, but it's a great habit. It's, it's also a lot of fun. What's your biggest pet peeve? We have this thing called being at cause. It's a pretty philosophical view that people talk about a lot, but, but this notion of rather than feeling something's happening to you, look at your own self and say, what is it that I could have done? What I don't like is when people come into my office and say, well, gee, this has happened to me and what can you do about it? as opposed to, no, no, here's what I would like to do about this. This is what I'm going to do about it. Here's the problem. And that is a very different orientation, but I think it's a really important one, particularly in our business where we're empowering people to be leaders very early on. How about on the investment side and the, the market structure? What's your biggest investment pet peeve? I think that there's a lot that's known facts in the world today. I mean, you can get your hands on consensus perspectives and secondary views and and there's just a lot of data out there that everybody knows. And so what I dislike the most when somebody starts talking about an investment thesis is they talk about what everybody else knows. Because by definition, that's a commodity. And so what I like to tell people is like, you got to come into my office and tell me what you uniquely have as a point of view. What is your unconventional wisdom? What is your insight about something that other people are not seeing in a consensus context? So Again, even like management says, it's like, well, okay, but management's going to say the same thing to everybody. So that's conventional wisdom. So that's kind of a, a pet peeve I have when I try to dive deeper into the Admiral Stockdale question, who are we and why are we here and why are we going to win this asset today? What's been your biggest investment mistake and what'd you learn from it? I have this very simple saying is if you don't understand it, don't invest in it. I invested in something where it was growing incredibly fast. We got a great deal on it relative to anybody else. We had an angle on it, but the model itself was pretty darn complicated and it didn't pass the elevator test of really something that had the longevity and robustness that the metrics would suggest. <laughs> and by the way, it was interesting. We, it, uh, we had a tombstone for the, for the closing. It was called a, it was a rocket ship, which kind of was a bad sign. And uh, it went really well for about a year and a half. And then all those unravelings of the business model happened and and we lost all our money. So I think in investment committees, what I've learned is ask the simple questions. Like, do you understand how this business works? Don't just look at the numbers and the financial trajectory. Do you understand? It's a very simple question. But oftentimes, people get caught up in that. 
What's your favorite book? Yeah, that's like asking your favorite album, but... You can answer that too if you want. We start on the musical theme. <laughs> this is pretty dark, actually. I took this business school class called uh, Moral Reflection Through Fiction. Actually, it used to be a Harvard class. My wife took it when she was there. I think they called it Guilt 101. But one of the books they made us read was The Death of Ivan Ilyich by Tolstoy. It's pretty dark about a guy that has a terminal illness and, and his wife and daughter are not being very supportive. But the truth of it is, it was somebody who had never looked into himself and decided how he wanted to live his life and have a life of meaning. And it's this dark context where he sees what it means that he wasn't doing to have a moral life of impact. I would encourage anybody to read it. It's a novella, so it's not, it doesn't even take that long. There's a lot of great lessons that came out of that book that I carry with me here. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? They're very optimistic people. I wish I had their optimism. It's like that old golf saying, you know, it, it doesn't go in the hole unless you put it there. And they're very optimistic people. And if you're going to have an ability to achieve what you want to achieve, you start, have to start off with the premise that it's possible. They had five kids. They were Irish immigrants. I was the youngest of five. Um, so the lessons always didn't trickle down to me. But they were very optimistic. And they, they made us all believe that we could do what we wanted to do. It seems pretty simple, but... It was meaningful. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in your life? By the way, this is a lot worse today, I think, for kids. And I, I hate to say this, but there's this question of conformity. Do you live a life of doing the things that you think are the things that other people are doing and the thing that is kind of the traditional path? Or do you meet the same friends or, or do you actually embrace diverse perspectives or difference or... I just found over time in life that you just want to have more experiences with more difference and more different contexts. And if you start the first part of your life conforming and trying to do what the people want you to do and you go down a certain path, I think it's very limiting in what it opens up for you as a life. And so it's kind of one of the, one of the things I miss right now is I traveling. I, I really miss seeing the perspective of my on the ground partners and management teams in Asia and Europe and Brazil and that's sort of the nature of something that I think is important for people to consider. Terrific. JC, it's really interesting and a lot of fun. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you. I really enjoyed it, Ted. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you'd like what you heard, please tell a friend and maybe even write a review on iTunes. You'll help others discover the show and I thank you for it. Have a good one and see you next time. Thank you.